Tired Justice Lex Lazary is with me. What what I'm trying to achieve here is sort of a, a look into the way the court system operates and the people in it. It's a rare thing to do. We have done it with Peter Kidd. We've done it with the former Chief Justice Marilyn Warren and uh, Lex Lazary at the moment retired. We can do it with a, a, a little less restriction. Um, the opposition um, overnight has uh, promised a policy whereby people can check if their partner has a history of domestic violence, I think just by going to a police station and asking them, can that work? I I saw that item and I frankly, the honest answer to your question is I've got no idea. I th- it's, there are obvious difficulties about the way information is used in order to make it work. The other thing is suppression <coughs> orders, which um, the public's not greatly aware of, but Victoria has got a record uh, number of suppression orders where things that happen in the court a judge says, you may not report this, mm. people must. That, that secrecy to me, and you'd expect me to say it, but that secrecy <laughs> is, uh, is counterproductive. Uh, why do we have so many? Well, Neil, I can only give you my um, perspective about that. I absolutely agree with the policy of the current legislation. Courts should be open. And whenever I've made suppression orders, it's always been for the purpose of protecting someone's right to a fair trial or in circumstances where someone is at risk of physical harm if they're identified. My orders, I think, have always been temporary until the verdict in the case that's being protected. Um, And regularly I've had the media come along and we've debated whether there should be a suppression order. Sometimes I've made them, sometimes I haven't. I I accept um, that they should only be made in rare circumstances and really only when it's absolutely necessary. So fewer rather than more? Yeah, fewer. But Mm. some are necessary. Drummer in a band, the Lex Pistols. Yes. Still. Yes. Racing car driver. Yes, of sorts. National champion. Ah, uh, not quite. <laughs> in fact, nowhere near. Neil. <laughs> <laughs> what were you racing? A Porsche. Oh, I started years ago in sports cars. I've got a Porsche GT3 Cup car at the moment, which I haven't driven since last year. Um, you put so it I raced at a wall, st- didn't you? I put it into the wall at Phillip Island. Yeah, I was a very lucky boy, I must say. Really? Is yeah, it hit pretty hard. So, um, are you going to drive it again? I hope. Well, I've spent the money to rebuild the car, so it would be a shame not to use it. You don't think at age 70 it's time to retire? I do exactly think that. <laughs> but you're not going <laughs> but to. But I'm not going to. But all these things in your background, um, did you really have time to be a law student? Or? No. Absolutely not. No, no time for being a law student. You weren't very good. I was having too much fun. I was not much good at all, Neil, as you well know, because <laughs> I've told you before. So what happened? I mean... Th- th- Normally, you'd expect a, a judge, and particularly yeah. you know, you've got one of the, the great records in the judiciary here in Victoria, and uh, a bum student. Of you. How does that happen? Look, two things happened, and I, I paid tribute uh, to one of them on Friday. I, I came across Professor Louis Waller at Monash when I started. He was my criminal law teacher, and he really did inspire me. I loved learning the criminal law. It didn't keep me on track for the rest of my university course. Uh, and then I, I, I got to be an article clerk and I walked into one of the Supreme Court rooms to do a civil case. And I, I was struck by the atmosphere of the courtroom and I have been ever since. That's really what happened. And Is I went the, to the bar. The theatre? Yeah, it's partly the theatre. It's partly my perception that the work is so worthwhile. Um, and, I, you know, it's Monday, Neil. I retired last Friday and I miss it already. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, I feel like, you know, I feel like someone who loves school and is on their first day at university. <laughs> When people walk into the court and they bow, to, are they bowing to the judge or the court? No, they're bowing to the court. It's a mark of respect for the court. It's not for the individual judge. Mm. And judges bow back. Do you remember, of all your years as a well, in, in, as a barrister as well, do you remember the good guys or the bad guys more? Oh, I think I probably remember the bad guys more, um, but not all of them. Um, and I've got a really a. A poor memory for cases. I tend to do the case and then forget about it. I, occasionally, in the last couple of years, my associate has some query has arisen about a case I've done, and I have not remembered even doing the case. I, I tend to block it out, get on with the next one. But there are a few that I remember, obviously. We touched on this I've, uh, in other industries: the police force, the ambulance, uh, traumatic industries. They've started to pay attention in recent years to the mental health of those in the middle of it. Are we paying enough attention to the mental health of judges? You, you, you're going through some... I mean, I've read the odd transcript. Uh, I remember the Port Arthur one stands yeah. out to me. Uh, Denya's uh, transcript stands yeah. out to me. And I'm just reading it, and you know, I'm sitting at home somewhere, but you're sitting there in the middle of it. Is mental health an issue for judges? Definitely. And judges and magistrates, and I particularly include magistrates because... 
the workload on the magistrate's court is enormous. Um, these people need to be supported. They need to be resourced, better resourced, uh, and they need, obviously, to be monitored so that when they need help, they get it. There's no question that there's a need there. It's only recently that people have even been interested in it because it's, in a sense, it's vicarious trauma. I mean, we're not at the scene like the police and ambulance are, but we do have to hear the detail in sometimes excruciating detail, look at the post-mortem photographs, things of that kind, deal with the victims, hear the witnesses give their evidence. It is difficult, and of course it has an effect. You, you can't sit there indifferent to this sort of stuff. It has an effect on people who have to process it because we have to then act on it. Is enough being done now? Well, it's we're getting there. I mean, there's a lot of developments that are occurring, a lot of improvements that are being made, and uh, I'm very supportive of those. Two cases I want to ask you about specifically away from the bench. Uh, one was the Hicks case. Yes. Uh, when you made several trips to Guantanamo Bay. Yes. What was it like there? Ah, uh, surreal. It was unbelievable. Um, and I had this weird idea when I went there the first time that I could just fly down to Havana, you know, enjoy some Cuban rum, catch a cab in the gate of the Guantanamo Bay Naval Facility and do my work. And of course, you couldn't do that. Um, and Guantanamo Bay itself in those days, probably still the same, is sort of an American military town transplanted to Cuba. Um, it's, it's quite bizarre with McDonald's and everything else that goes with that sort of a place. Um, what was bizarre was the military commission process that they set up. It was just barely believable that a government could do what they did because what they did was set up a system that was designed to get people found guilty and the death penalty applied to most of them. Did you, could you believe that they were at a level of torture and mistreatment that was alleged when you went in there? I, I didn't see it myself, didn't but I, I don't, I'm not surprised at the allegations. Mm. The other case uh, was the case of Van Nguyen, the young uh, Melbourne uh, man who was yep. executed in Singapore for drug smuggling, and you and Julian McMahon both worked on that case. I think that's where I first uh, I first met you. Um, I'll just if you just put the headphones on, I I found today some of a discussion we had the 28th of November 2005, a couple of days before he was executed, and you've been representing him. I have to admit, being frightened myself, Neil, I, I, um, I just don't know at the moment how we're going to deal with it. But um, as I've said plenty of times before, I, I intend to draw on the courage that our client is showing, and uh, if he can demonstrate the courage and fortitude that he that he's demonstrating for what he's about to face, then the least we can do is do the same for what we have to face, which is obviously a great deal less. It must. It's almost unbelievable to think you go and sit with a man and talk to him shortly before he dies. And yeah. You, and you know what's happening. How, yes. did you, how did you cope with it? Uh, well, I did what I said I was going to do. I drew on Van's courage. I, it was as simple as that. And, of course, there were three of us. Uh, um, one of Van's great frustrations was that he didn't convert me to Christianity before he died. Uh, Julian McMahon, who was, was there as well, is a devoted uh, Christian and... Joseph Fasera, who was also with us, uh, is as well. And so I drew a great deal of strength from Van's, the way he was facing his fate, uh, and and from those other two men who were... Uh, we supported each other, but they certainly supported me. You've opened a door there, not converting to Christianity. Uh, all those years, all those... Some of them awful <coughs> cases, and, and perhaps in a way, somebody like Van Nguyen was uh, inspirational. To he, he was. He was inspirational. What did that do to your belief system? Um, it didn't change it much. Um, Does it exist? Oh, well, now, Neil, <laughs> <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> um, look, I, I wouldn't presume to know. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope that what those who believe in it believe is, is right, but I, I just don't know. I'm not convinced. Um, there is so much suffering in the world, not just in Australia, but around the world. I just don't understand how a merciful God could let that happen. But... That's a that's another discussion for another time. Yeah, I think. of course, of course. Uh, the um, I must ask you about this. I don't expect that you'll be enthusiastic about answering it, but there was a there were two issues standing up with the politicians. One didn't I don't think involved you, which was the the threatened contempt charges against three politicians. The other one was a tweet you made about uh, Peter Dutton, uh, which which brought a reaction from Peter Dutton on the issue of of. Um, uh, of African crime. Um, regrets? Oh, look, Neil, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. The tweet wasn't about Peter Dutton. No. It was a reaction to him. Um, but, you know, it, 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 
obviously caused a controversy that I wish hadn't happened, and I just don't want to take it any further, if that's okay. Don't want to, no, I understand entirely. In this court, you don't have to answer no, no, questions. No, 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 no. I can't be locked up if I don't answer the question. Ivory Tower? No, I don't think so, really. I don't think so. I, I, there's just no feeling of an ivory tower. Um, I understand why people think it, but really it's not like that at all. It's a very, very busy workplace. And um, you know, my colleagues <clears throat> my colleagues are doing everything they can to do their job properly. I don't think there's anything ivory towerish about the way they approach their work. In all of them, not just the criminal judges, all of them. How do you get that across to the public? By telling them, I think, by saying the sort of things that I just said. I mean, I've had nearly 11 years of experience. I see my colleagues every day. I see the way they approach their work. I, I know Chief Justice Ferguson pretty well now, and uh, there's certainly nothing like that about her. She's a most practical, determined, clever woman, and uh, um, I think anyone who thought they were in an ivory tower would soon incur her disapproval. We, we've one call for you, yeah. if that's all right. If you just put the <coughs> headphones on. Um, it goes back to your student day, so you might not like this either. <laughs> no, I'm nervous. Hello, John. Morning, Neil and Lex. Good to be here. Um, yes, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Lex on 50 years, and I recall, I think, 1965 back at Halebury College. Um, and, uh, yeah, I still remember Lex from there. So uh, <laughs> it's good to hear he's uh, finally retired and uh, made good of himself. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, John. I, it may not be a permanent retirement. John, thank you very much for calling. Lex Lazary, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, just one final question, because I did raise this with Marilyn Warren when she was Chief Justice. Well, I raised a couple of similar issues. Could we ever elect judges? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, because uh, any election process will thoroughly compromise the way they do their work. There's, it's just out of the question. And you watch what happens in America. You see how it goes. It's just... It's just not on. I don't think anyone seriously says we should do it here. Could we ever have a jury setting sentences? No, not practical. Which is not to say their views aren't relevant, but it's just not practical to have a jury involved in that process after their verdict. The court is not going to, well, won't be part of the sentencing guidelines council as even as a reserve judge, could you be? No, I think the court's position is that as a retired judge I could be, but as a reserve judge I shouldn't be, and that's a position I agree with. Okay. Would you be interested as a retired judge? I'd I'd talk to somebody about it. I don't must say I don't know a great deal about it, but if it if it would help, possibly. Rather be a reserve judge. No, I'd rather be a reserve judge. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank Care, you, Neil. Careful with that car, please. Yeah, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Lex Lazary, Supreme Court judge, eleven years.